At Facebook, we have a zero tolerance policy against human trafficking, sex trafficking, forced labor, people smuggling, and modern day slavery. We're also committed to working with expert organizations, tackling these issues on the ground in vulnerable communities. We're delighted to be partnering with Stop the Traffic and to support them in their awareness raising and information gathering campaign in the Fenlands. This campaign is a really great example of the power of collaboration and we're really proud to support it. Fenland's more of a geographic zone. It's this flat land, very, very agricultural, big demand for migrant workers, but where it moves into potential exploitation is the vulnerable and the weak that get preyed upon. When people are the victims of human trafficking and exploitation, it's not to do with bondage, chains, locked in, in buildings. It's to do with control. The people that are controlling these, these victims are very sophisticated and can identify weaknesses in individuals that they can exploit. At busy times, 200, 250 people can be dropped off in, a, in any given week. They're often dropped off at Central Point, which is this garage in the middle of town where they're then picked up. The majority of people are just looking for an opportunity. They're desperate. They want to get away. They want to see the streets paved with gold. Sometimes people come into the country, they've got nowhere to live. That begins the journey of debt bondage, where someone says, oh, well, I'll pay for your rent for the first few months till you get a job. You owe me that, you have to do what I tell you. You're gonna to have to work where I tell you. You've got to live where I tell you, do what I tell you. And there's, there's threats of physical violence potentially as well. These traffickers are serious and organized criminals. You and I might buy a fridge, a television. They buy people. Stop the traffic wants to change the environment so that it isn't worth the effort, the money, the resource to keep running the trafficking business. We're looking for patterns. We're looking for the hotspots and routes that we believe the intelligence is leading us to, where there is great vulnerability, where there is potential for us to campaign. We found a way of getting messages to communities that are vulnerable to traffickers and giving them a different story and we're using social media to do that, and Facebook have been superb in, in leading that work out with us. Facebook has supported Stop the Traffic a variety of ways, and, and specifically through provision of, of ad credits, which allows Stop the Traffic to harness the power and scale of our community to get the message out there and affect real change on the ground. I mean, the key to this is access. It's simply getting access to vulnerable communities. We ran four posts over a week in both Lithuanian and English on Facebook and Instagram. We geo-targeted them at four towns in the Fenlands that we knew that were particularly dormitories for um, the diaspora Lithuanian community that we were confident was being exploited. And the results are extraordinary. About 250,000 people were reached with these posts. That's an incredible number in itself. We saw that not only was the community in the Fenlands getting alive to these issues, it was spreading back home in Lithuania. It was spreading in other Lithuanian communities around the country. This is the best I have ever seen in over 40 years in the business. It taught us that we really could change the attitude of a community that was vulnerable to trafficking. Human trafficking thrives in the darkness where people aren't looking. When you shine a light on something, by everybody understanding what they're looking at, by people in every community just being more aware, shining a little bit of light in the darker areas of what's happening around them, it becomes harder for criminals to operate effectively. Every community is vulnerable to trafficking. The Fenlands is one story, a powerful story, of a community where people said, not here, not in my community, and our vision and success will only be where every community has the power to make the change. Hello, my name's Gail Kent, and I'm the Global Public Policy Lead on Law Enforcement for Facebook. And it's my huge honor to welcome you here today to talk about a topic that's been incredibly important to me throughout my career. 
Um, but I have to start with an apology, which is never good. Thank you very much for being patient and <laughs> getting in here today. Um, security is important to us, and hopefully you've had enough wine to make up for it. <laughs> Um, but it's also my great pleasure to hand over to the woman who's probably single-handedly responsible for us all being here today. So, Ruth, over to you. Well, hi, everyone. Hi, Good everyone. evening. Um, I have a confession to make. Um, you saw me in that video. I hope you're thinking, gosh, she looks better on stage. Um, because I had actually got off a flight and gone especially to be filmed. And my daughter, who is 23, watched that film at the weekend and said, are you actually going to show that in public? <laughs> um, and uh, I, I am just saying to you, um, I was jet lagged. <laughs> I, I was, I, you know, I hadn't, I'd, I got off a 12, 14 hour flight, I'd arrived. But do you know what? That was the worst it got for me because I was safe. I was amongst friends who told me I look great. <laughs> and we are here today because it's still big business. We're here because there are not just a few tens, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands. There are millions of people around our world for whom they're transported. And the worst thing is not that they look jet lagged. So we're here today because there are stories, each of us sit here with stories that have brought us here. And David in the video was a, a friend, a volunteer of Stop the Traffic eight, ten years ago. He's here, so he can share that with you later. He's here because ten years later we're making a difference because we've learned with technology. So thank you, friends, first, for being here, for being part of that journey. And if you're here to learn, I hope you go away inspired. And together we can stop the traffic. It's my pleasure to introduce Neil Giles, uh, he was in the video. He said this is the greatest change that he's had in 40 years, law enforcement. I like that line. And he's going to come and just describe, we've been on a journey, for all of you who have journeyed with us, 15 years for me, from the beginning of Stop the Traffic. Neil, I met in 2010. I took him to India for a conference that Stop the Traffic held, and there... Just there, we began in a Costa Coffee to sit and begin to realize the sheer scale, the sh sheer challenge, um, the sheer difficulty to stop the traffic. That journey has been one of learning, and that's what we're excited tonight. Can I be excited? Yeah. We're excited because we want to share with you what we're learning, what we're learning together, what we need to learn, and what inevitably we will only ever do if we do it together. So please give a warm welcome to Neil Giles. Thank you, Ruth. Good evening, everybody. Um, I thought I looked so old in that video that I really want to see some change in this environment before I get too old to do it anymore. Um, so, please work. Okay. Um, what do we do? Um, I, we're about following the intelligence. I used to think, like a police officer thinks, that by arresting and prosecuting people, that was a primary route to prevention. Um, I have learned differently. Um, I've learned that with the enormity of, of, of this problem, you need to think in ways that are unconventional. And I'd like to think that uh, the route we're showing you this evening, the results that we're showing you this evening, um, help to show you that by breaking those norms, you can make a change. Uh, just to put this into context, uh, trafficking works as a crime because it's low risk and high profit. Uh, and the current academic uh, research suggests very strongly that there are about 40.3 million people in circumstances of slavery exploitation around the world um, at the moment. And indeed, the thing that shocked me slightly was just under 90 million people in the last five years have had an experience of exploitation and slavery. I think that's a lot. Um, and of course, that looks like terrible news when you put that in the context that two years ago, I was talking about numbers far less than that. You'll see on the right-hand side of the slide the current thinking suggests that Great Britain um, has about 136,000 people in circumstances of, of modern-day slavery, trafficked victims. 
Um, yet, only three years ago, we were talking about 13,500 um, in this country. Uh, so, you know, the good news that was appears to be now very bad news. But I think there may be something different at work here. I, th I think what looks like bad news is just much more like the reality that there always was. And I think the good aspect of that is that we, we are beginning to see as a society what exploitation slavery looks like all around us. Maybe we're just beginning to take the veils off um, because it's been hidden in plain sight across the supply chains that feed us and clothe us, um, the things that we buy every day, and, and every part of society we engage with, our banks, our businesses, where we live and work. Now, there are tens, hundreds of not-for-profits and other like entities uh, around the globe who are really interested in this issue and want to make a change. Um, and, and they're involved in all kinds of activity, and I know that rescue and rehabilitation is a big part of many NGOs' rationale for, for being. Um, and, and that's really important for us to do well, but it isn't going to make the problem go away. My sense is for every rescue, it's a vacancy. It's an opportunity for another recruitment. And we need to bear that firmly in mind. So you've got to work at both ends of this equation effectively. Um, I told you about my arrest and prosecution story. I spent a long time in law enforcement. The justice process, rule of law, is really, really important as a bedrock for our lives and work. But it isn't going to make this problem go away. Um, given the scale of the problem, it's a little bit like a flea biting an elephant. It's not going to notice. So our journey has led us to the place that uh, defines this as something we need to be much more intelligent about because the resources are finite. All of us have got limited ability to affect this issue, so we need to understand where best to focus it. So that's why we began a journey um, with partners, uh, and we're hoping to collect more partners this evening, um, to collect industrial quantities of stories of trafficking, not personal data. I don't need to know who was trafficked or who does the trafficking, although there are occasions when the public do tell us that. I'm more interested in what happened and where it happened, why it happened and how it happened, because I can aggregate that and analyse that using the tools that our friends of I at IBM have given us. Um, to begin to build that into a real understanding of hotspots and the characteristics of those hotspots, which I contend are very useful when you share them with actors who can do something. Uh, and there are some key pinch points for trafficking businesses around the world, and we can, uh, we can throw some petrol and set fire to those, frankly. Um, and this is about driving down the business that is trafficking. So what works? Um, we all talk about technology saving us. Technology is a brilliant addition to the equation when it's used well. It needs people and technology. It needs a, a good understanding of how best to use technology. Just throwing technology at a problem isn't going to solve anything. Um, in this context, technology is brilliant. Facebook have been a brilliant partner together with IBM. Facebook have been a brilliant partner because they have shown us how, by using targeted advertising effectively in a, in a geolocated way, that we can begin to reach communities that previously were very difficult for us to reach. Um, it's an extraordinary opportunity that we need to maximise, and I hope and pray that Facebook, Instabra Instagram stay strong partners with us for the foreseeable future, even if I do ask them for industrial quantities of ad credits. Um, you have to work with actors on the ground. You cannot simply conduct a Facebook, Instagram campaign with a vulnerable community from afar and expect to get a result. So each and every one of us in this room has got a part to play. Whether you're a business that operates in a vulnerable area, whether you're a bank that banks in that part of the world, or you bank those businesses, if you're an NGO on the ground, if you're law enforcement, if you're local authorities, we need to work with you and we need to have everybody working together to drive this problem down. And that's where we found success. Um, sharing is really important. 
we find it difficult to share what we know. I bet everybody in this room that's involved in a not-for-profit has got useful intelligence. Law enforcement, banks and businesses find it really difficult to share their knowledge. We need to break that paradigm by sharing in a way that's safe and effective. can be done. And if you're not doing it, please come see me afterwards. And key groups need sensitising. You know, we work brilliantly with Barclays in the Fenlands, training their frontline staff to spot trafficking in a way I don't think that they'd ever done before. Uh, and, and the results were immense. You know, they started to see um, the world of trafficking in their branch in a way that they'd never seen before. And I think that's really important. And the public sector as well needs to understand that there are plenty of police officers out there who do not know what trafficking looks like when it drives past them. We need to help them do that. So, let's show you a little bit of um, some of the feedback we've been getting from those partners we've been working with. Cue the video. If I had to describe Stop the Traffic in three words, it would be intelligence, innovation and influence. They're experts, they know exactly what they're talking about and really help us to inform and shape our strategy. Stop the Traffic offer us something that we don't currently offer and that's this, this Centre for Intelligence-led Prevention. Stop the Traffic have themselves engaged with a huge number of stakeholders within the public, private and NGO sectors. Working with Stop the Traffic has meant that we become stronger, better and more focused. And something that we learned was actually that the risks weren't always where we expected them to be. Ultimately, we could find ourselves able to predict human exploitation rather than reacting to events on the ground. Those are a few of our partners over recent times. Um, we have, in the last 12 months, begun a process to truly understand the impact of what we've been doing. Um, when I first began working with our friends at Facebook almost two years ago now, I was convinced that I was seeing extraordinary results. But every time I got challenged, um, it, it became difficult for me to define quite how that impact could be measured. So we started a process earlier this year to begin to monitor, evaluate, and factor in each learning process uh, into our work. Uh, and these are the overview of the results from that campaign we talked about in the Fenlands, the video that you saw at the beginning of the show. Um, 250,000 people reached by the Facebook posts. Um, nearly 40,000 people from Lithuania who were in that community reached. 80% of those people, when we went back uh, in a post-event survey, 80% of that community we know opened the video and, and looked at what we had to say. And we went back and asked them afterwards in a post-event survey, 45% of that 80% told us that they had changed the way they engaged with offers of work as a result of our campaign. I think that's an extraordinary statistic. We have changed the, the attitude of that community in a measurable way. Uh, and it really is a brilliant learning point for us and something that we need to build in going forward. Not only did we, um, did we pick up that kind of feedback, we also understood from the way that the, uh, the posts were shared around the, around the globe and, and back in Lithuania, that we've now got our focus for the next campaign. We know where we need to go in Lithuania, working with our friends in the Lithuanian government who were very supportive of, of what we did here and very keen to see that their people stopped being exploited when they were here in, in the UK for work. Um, so that enhanced intelligence picture is something that we need to leverage going forward. And it's uh, an interesting step in the right direction. So we've been, as you've seen from the, the, the video clips earlier, been working with businesses to try to help them to be more resilient to the issue of trafficking as it comes across their employment practices and their supply chain. Three engagements with this particular FTSE 100 company over a period of two years. Um, excellent feedback, great testimonials for us, but really help that business become more resilient to trafficking and, and as that work spreads across businesses, I contend that it will begin to trickle good practice across industry much more widely. It's a brilliant dampener for, um, for the business of trafficking in the way that we would like to see. 
I've put this up as a, as a comparator. If this business that we're talking about is actually $150 billion turnover a year, that's an extraordinary amount when you compare it with um, some, of, some of the other global greats that, that we've put on the screen here. Most of that money at some stage is coming into the finance system. So it just tells you that it's a no-brainer for us to work with um, finance industry to help them spot it and stop it. Uh, and the way we're doing that is by beginning to work in partnership with them, feeding them with both specific and thematic reporting, particularly as we work out what the overlay is with, with their business profile. Um, and I think the future is much stronger than your customer, which is what KYC means, um, and due diligence work. Many of, much of that fund line is coming in through what appears to be genuine revenue from businesses around the world. And we need our finance partners to understand the risk and ask, ask better questions of those businesses that are vulnerable to trafficking. And you're going to hear about something called Traffic Analysis Hub shortly. I won't steal John McGlass um, thunder, but uh, it's, it's well worth it. So, given this body of information that we're accruing um, in our data hub, um, my sense of this is once it starts to get big enough, it becomes an interesting tool to begin um, to predict where the vulnerabilities are going to be as we, uh, as we start to move the business, to disrupt and displace the business. Uh, and that becomes truly exciting because that's the opportunity to get in front of, of the development of trafficking over the next few years. Um, so I'd like to see that start to happen. Um, that, I think, is the end of my soliloquy this afternoon. Um, thanks for listening. I really look forward to talking to you both later today uh, and a little further on. Um, so handing over to John McGrath, I think, or the team. Beg your pardon. Thank you, Neil. Thanks so much. Okay, so, I, so my name is Caroline Taylor, for those of you who don't know me, um, and uh, I have the privilege to be the chair of trustees of uh, Stop the Traffic globally. Um, and so I have the task now to uh, introduce you to a rather fabulous panel we have lined up. Let me go and lurk down here. Um, so uh, could I ask my wonderful panellists to uh, jump up and uh, take a seat, please? Um, yay, big round of applause. Thank you. Any particular? Take a seat, any seat. <laughs> okay, okay. So we're going to start with the uh, gentleman on my left, on your right, um, who is uh, Sir Rob Wainwright, who is uh, currently, well, nowadays, a senior partner at Deloitte's, um, but actually, uh, until fairly recently, was the executive director at Europol. So you can imagine he has quite a lot of uh, fab fabulous insight and knowledge about this topic. Um, and... Uh, and, and uh, Rob, I think, knighted uh, in recognition of all the extraordinary work that you have done and led um, in this space. Um, sitting next to Rob, uh, we have Geraldine Lawler. Geraldine is the Global Head of Financial Crime at Barclays. Um, and uh, alongside that, I mean, you've done a lot of work, Geraldine, over the years, I think, at Barclays and in other banks around that space. Um, but also, you've done a lot of work, um, I understand, you know, representing the financial industry on various bodies, um, chairing the Financial Crime Committee for UK Finance and um, uh, the, the Economic Crime Board at UK Finance and um, have been the UK industry lead at Five Eyes Law mm -hmm. Enforcement. So, um, uh, again, somebody from a bit from the business, purely from the business, um, to the point, uh, some of the points that Neil was just making, uh, but again, with lots of amazing uh, experience and insight to share with us. Um, and last but certainly not least, you met her briefly earlier, Gail Kent. Uh, Gail is the global public, public policy lead for Facebook, um, leading on law enforcement and surveillance, so globally, but, but here um, it, with us in, in London today. Um, now, Gail, you've, had, you've got a mixture, a little bit like Rob, I guess, that you spent many years um, with the... Um, yeah, Rob was my boss. Rob was your time. boss. <laughs> Rob was your boss. He oh doesn't look old enough, I know, but <laughs> he was. Excellent. So, um, yeah, working with, uh, working with the UK's National Crime Agency, um, an extent with Five Eyes and Europol and Interpol, um, and actually, you were telling me earlier about um, some years you spent in Italy um, working in this space, which yeah. uh, right at the sharp end, um, as it were. So, um, but also you do a lot of academic research, I understand. So um, I do, yeah. Wonderful. So again, bringing a business in your current role um, and uh, a law enforcement perspective and, 
an evidence base, which Neil would love because this is all about evidence and intelligence. So, without further ado, I'm going to try and perch on this and not fall off it. I don't always feel like a Des O'Connor moment when you sit on one of these. Um, she says, showing her age, rather. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for the young ones, don't worry. Don't, don't bother Googling it. It's just, you know, I'm not sure even Google could keep, could keep up with that. So I'm um, really interested uh, to share with everybody here. Um, Gail, let me start with you. I mean, you know, Facebook, this extraordinary um, social media platform, was such an opportunity to, to, to make an impact here. Do, do you want to tell us? I mean, we saw some on the video and heard from Amy, but tell us a bit more about what Facebook's doing. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary responsibility to work for a platform that's got 2.3 billion users. And you can imagine that someone who's looking after our law enforcement policy, um, that that's a number that weighs on my shoulders pretty heavily every day. With 2.3 billion users, and you'll all know this, you see the good as well as the bad of humanity. Um, so I think there, like for us, there are really sort of like three areas in which working with um, NGOs like Stop the Traffic gives us sort of opportunities. And the first has to be in like understanding what actually is human trafficking. And I think that probably all of us on the panel know that there's a lot of sort of nuances around it. There's a lot of sort of difficulty understanding exactly what is human trafficking and how you spot you spot the signs, even though, as, as Ruth and Neil have said, it's often in there in, in plain sight. So what can we do in terms of having those conversations to really understand um, what's happening on the platform? Because we have a zero tolerance um, for human trafficking. We want to make sure that that isn't happening on Facebook. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, um, what can we do to use the platform to raise awareness? And you saw that in the video. Mm -hmm. And it's been fantastic working with the team, not just in the Finlands, but to work out how can we show an entire trafficking route. So she said, I was in Italy. And Italy is really one of the centers of human trafficking and human smuggling for, um, uh, for various routes. Um, and what Stop the Traffic have been able to do with Facebook is to highlight along that entire route, so whether it's from North Africa or Afghanistan, um, and raise, um, raise awareness in communities along that route. So it's been great <coughs> to be able to help them do that at scale. And then the last thing, and you'll see a bit more about this with IBM, but is trying to show what the power of technology is in terms of trying to, um, to tackle this problem. So we had a hack in May this year and Stop the Traffic and Thorne and other groups were part of that to really sort of dig into how could we better use technology in particular to stop child trafficking. So lots of opportunities. Amazing, yeah. amazing, amazing to hear it. Um, Geraldine, um, we were talking earlier um, and, um, and I know, you know, again, we saw on the video some of the work that Barclays have been directly involved with um, in partnership with Facebook and Stop the Traffic. But um, you and I were talking about, you know, how will we know when we're winning? What will winning even look like? Um, an interesting question, because we were talking about it in the context of uh, winning versus won. Yes. Um, so, uh, because of often when you start to really understand this threat and how it manifests and then go after it in terms of leveraging your data and providing intelligence across to law enforcement, it helps to disrupt it. But often with criminals, they become very versatile and they just move into a different way of how they operate. So um, so the ability to, uh, to understand that and, and look to disrupt it is one part. The second piece, which we talk about in the wider sense, because at the heart of this, this is, this is organized crime. Yeah. Um, and there will be st statistics thrown around there that 1% of criminal proceeds actually get confiscated in terms of the entire mass that's out there. And if you look at $150 billion crime that this is, then 1% just isn't good enough. So what do we want to target as a winning number in this particular space? So, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to certainly be in double digits and sort of be heading up in that trajectory, and that would be quite significant because winning here is about making it very difficult for criminals to succeed. You know, if they're in a 99% profit industry, uh, that's quite extraordinary. So we have to absolutely stop that. Um, and that's at the disruption end, whilst at the same time then working with our partners and thinking about how we educate society so that uh, we start to disrupt it at the prevention uh, end. And really that is how we garner society, bring it together, raise the profile, raise the awareness and understanding of how this manifests in our societies. 
and then we're actually coming together as a whole. So it's not just down to law enforcement or ourselves to yeah. try and disrupt this. It's actually really sort of harnessing the community uh, uh, as a whole to sort of really get out there and say no more. You yeah. know? And so that for me is when you start to see it coming together in that way, we will start to see this winning. Yeah, and attacking it from both ends. Rob, um, I guess both from your former life in, in Europol, leading Europol, but also in the work that you now do um, at Deloitte's with your clients, um, what's getting in the way? What's stopping us? I think it's, it's um, enough goodwill, enough people who are paying attention to this. If there's one thing that, that has been a dominant theme, a concern for me over 15 years of being involved to a lesser or greater extent in, in, in this uh, fighting this ugly trade, it's been you know, patchy awareness, um, patchy support. Initially, all those years ago, you know, we, we, we had five European countries at best that were, that were really engaged in this. Luckily, UK was one of them. Uh, coming to Europol, it took a while to get it onto the agenda of the top priority agenda of EU ministers, for example. I think, you know, Theresa May is, you know, deserves a lot of credit for really bringing modern slavery up, up, up to the top of the agenda here in the United Kingdom. Um, and indeed, the legislation behind that, I think the model for, for what the UK has done is great. But, but sustaining that now at a time when you know, the attention of, of, of ministers, the attention of law enforcement chiefs are also sort of tugged in different directions with this terrible terrorist outbreak that we've had across Europe over the last five years, for example, the time of budget cuts, you know, it requires um, a leadership, a spark of leadership. It requires people with authority, with respect, those that can make a difference and can, can appeal uh, to a broader audience. That's why people like, um, you know, what, what Neil is doing um, at Stop the Traffic is really important. That's why Stop the Traffic is important. That's why huge companies like Facebook supporting it is, is so important. And that, that's, that's the concern for me, broadening the alliance. Because if what works ab absolutely is partnership working. Uh, and I've seen a, 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 at Europol when we're able to, you know, get a, a huge concerted mm. economy behind what we're trying to do, when we teamed up the law enforcement community with social media platforms, including Facebook, to try and take on terrorist propaganda online, when we did the same with the tech giants to try and combat um, child sexual abuse, it really worked. When we worked mm. with Geraldine and others to go after uh, money launderers to improve this woeful 1% figure, it began to work. Mm. And in this area, it will begin to work as well because when you have a coalescing agent, whether or not it's a Facebook or a Stop the Traffic, the center of gravity just to mobilize people in the community, then I think it will make a big difference. And if I can just add one yeah. thing, the one, so the one thing that I found um, most notable moving from law enforcement to Facebook is you've got a different way of thinking and a different sort of system of approaching problems. And if you've got a variety of different um, groups and stakeholders in the room, then you come up with different types of solutions. And I don't think if, if I hadn't been at Facebook and hadn't been sort of like brainstorming how can we help, we would have even come up with the idea about ad credits and targeting. And I think that these sorts of issues, whether it's terrorism or money laundering or, um, or human trafficking, they need different solutions now. We know mm. that the old solutions aren't going to work, and it's only by having different types of stakeholders in the room are we really going to solve them in a, in a way that is sustainable. Great. And one thing just to add to mm. what you were mentioning there about um, the leadership piece. So you do need a trigger in which to start that. And, and to your point, uh, Theresa May, this is, she's been very passionate about this particular area and has almost started that. But we can't be dependent on government to drive this. It needs to be the business and you know the combined between our NGOs coming together and actually giving it the momentum that it needs. So if you think about the modern slavery piece, we, you know, large corporates are looking to sign themselves up and put their statements out there. It can't be just about a statement. It has to be about actually what underpins that statement. So you know, Barclays, for example, has 15,000 suppliers across 30 countries. So we need to look at this risk on both a global and a local element yeah. and really actually as a, as a sort of a business community take the lead in actually starting to change this right th down through our supply chains whilst also looking at local initiatives that we can work on together to sort of really bring this to life and start disrupted at that level. And I think that, so that's such an important point. I mean, the, you know, large corporations have um, that, uh, that opportunity to influence the many other corporations with whom they work. 
um, who, who supply them and all the way through their supply chains and can apply you know, some really strong pressure there. So it's great to see you know, the likes of Barclays and others really leading the way. Um, so what is it about this uh, stop the traffic approach that, it, I mean, it's, it's got all of you engaged. It's got all of these fabulous people in the room today engaged and, and many, many thousands besides. What is it about this intelligence-led approach that, because I mean, look, we all, we all work for commercial entities and, and, and we're all here and it's because we believe in this. So what makes you believe in it, Gail? <laughs> I think that there's probably two things. I've seen like, in, uh, in my day job here, but also in my day job working for Rob in the, in the National Crime Agency, you really see that this is, is human harm at its very worst. This is, you know, these are, are people like us who are being put in the very worst circumstances. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, I mean, I, I dealt with people that were being trafficked in trucks across from, from Greece to, to Italy and who were, who were literally hoping they'd be alive at the end of it. So I think there's like understanding that is why I'm here. But the other part is that there, you, you need more than goodwill. You need facts. You can, you know, you need to make sure that you're targeting ads at communities that will recognise this. You can't just doing it in a scattergun approach. And I think that for me, um, using evidence-based and intelligence-led policing is is the sort of like is the key to cracking this problem because we're putting the solution where it matters rather than just hoping for the goodwill of the people that it reaches. And and uh, Geraldine, I think that you know that point of intelligence-led. Yes, I think we would all you know agree that's I mean fundamental to law enforcement, let alone anything else. But um, the role of an organisation like Barclays to both contribute to that evidence base, but also to make good use of it. I mean, that, that presumably that's a, that's a major reason that's got Barclays, you know, engaged in this yeah, totally. particular I mean, initiative. Totally. We, we came to this, obviously, starting almost from that financial crime lens mm. where... Uh, you know, you want to really go out there and disrupt this and actually the role that we can play in that. But then what you start to, to realise, actually, it's much broader than that and it, it starts to actually hit on the values of the organisation um, and then bring those to life in terms of the work that we do together and in partnership. And I think the, the other thing for me is initiatives like what started here in the UK, the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, really starts to bring together the power of partnership and public-private partnership. We all have an element that we can play into this, and actually, when you start to bring the different elements together, you start to create the whole. Um, and that becomes far more powerful than trying to address it in our own silos. Yeah. Um, and for me, uh, I think all of the people that work, f work with me in, in our organisation are just so passionate about this and particularly when you see the results and you come together and start to realise how this affects our societies, it affects its harm, it affects prosperity in the societies in which we live, it becomes normalised in the society in which we are, we are living and as consumers we actually are buying services from people who are being trafficked mm. um, and actually sometimes when you bring that home you go no, you know, we're, we're not going to tolerate this anymore so you switch from your role as a day job into you as a human being and how actually you know, it, it becomes really impo important that we do something about this. Yeah, Rob, um, with your in your new role at Deloitte, mm. um, you'll be advising and working with many organisations. <laughs> how do how does an organisation like Stop the Traffic? How do how can you advise Stop the Traffic? How do they get many many more organisations to be part of this? Well, to be to be successful, of course. And, and as Neil had said earlier, there, there are a lot of NGOs in this space. All of them doing great work. Um, competing for you know a, a relatively small amount of, of, of attention, and actually you know the the problem the trade in, in in human trafficking is intrinsically heinous, but actually so are many other forms of very serious crimes. Yeah. Uh, that's not really the point. And actually, sometimes I think um, something that's emotional led isn't necessarily the best way to 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 really <coughs> really get to grips with something like this. I always thought that in law enforcement, when people were saying we've got to invest more in child sex offenders because, 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 for example. Actually, what makes Stop the Traffic different here is they're, they're, they're doing something quite unique there, and they're succeeding. And after 15 years of sort of maturing, um, after following a data-centric approach, which so obviously mm -hmm. works, it's the reason behind Facebook's global success, it's the reason why Europol works so well, and and using the, the, the unique data collection enterprise it has to really follow the, the, the trade, 
and use that, therefore, to power a message is something that really works. Um, so, uh, you know, for, for Stop the Traffic, I think it needs to point to its success uh, and its ability to use data and its ability to bring different partnership and alliances together. And I think everyone in this room can help in that because at the moment it's been a successful but relatively narrow alliance base. Yeah. And we've done great work with Geraldine and others in, in, in the banking sector. It needs to be more than the banking sector. It needs to be more than the supply chain in, in certain other sectors. This requires heavy lifting from across society, across all areas of, of commercial life, in my view. Yeah, yeah, here, here. Well, I, I think that's a great point to place to um, end our panel. So can I just thank you, Rob? Thanks, Geraldine. Thank you, Gail. Fantastic uh, points. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> And step back on the stage um, because uh, my name is Caroline Taylor and I'm the CMO of IBM Global Markets. Um, that's my day job. That's one I get paid for. Um, and um, uh, it's, uh, it's our great privilege um, to work with uh, Stop the Traffic. And I say we, I really mean fabulous people like my glamorous assistant here, John McGrath. Um, because, um, because, you know, yes, technology is an amazing enabler. You, you've heard it from Facebook. You can see how that's working. Technology is an amazing enabler of all of, of, of all of this. You know, and we know that the traffickers have been using technology for a long time. We know that's been happening. Um, and, uh, you know, they use it to commit their crimes and they use it to cover their tracks. Um, and, of course, what Stop the Traffic is doing is saying, yeah, no, 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 we're going to use data and technology to disrupt you and to prevent you from doing this stuff. And at IBM, for 107 years now, we've been about using technology to make the world work better, you know, to improve things for people, for society, um, and doing it profitably, which is a really clever move because it's terribly sustainable. Um, it's very important, very important. So y when you take what Stop the Traffic is doing and, uh, and the work that they've been doing and the opportunity that IBM had, uh, and I need to say this very quickly and very loudly, not because of Caroline, because of some of my fabulous colleagues, John McGrath most recently, Mark Wakefield, who's somewhere in the room, um, can't see him, but anyway, somewhere, hiding, um, uh, Mark Wakefield from our team, who saw the opportunity, saw the opportunity for IBM to actually get involved beyond having Caroline pitch up at board meetings a few times a year. Um, um, and, um, you know, some early days provided some analytical capability through a product called i2 and some training. Some of our data scientists got involved. Um, and it was only a few months after that um, that, uh, that stopped the traffic with a bunch of partners in law enforcement or in Belgium and France and here in the UK and Western Union and Europol actually were able to take that insight that they were generating and used it to break up a trafficking ring of 32 traffickers in Belgium. Really, really early win. You know, quick wins. Those of you who uh, work in the business space will know that we're all about quick wins, aren't we? We're all about low-hanging fruit. That was a quick win. Um, and, and I think it, it was very inspiring for Stop Traffic, but it was really inspiring for the IBMers. Because the IBMers went, oh, my goodness. You know, the, 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 that little thing we did that we helped with, this is what happens. Um, so, of course, uh, got, you know, seriously, seriously involved at that point. Because trafficking leaves digital fingerprints. It really does. But you have to know where to look. And you have to have enough data to work out and tease out the patterns so you actually know what you're looking at. Um, because this information is sitting in so many places. It's in the survivors' narratives. You know, we talked about rescue and all the NGOs doing really valuable work. It's in the narratives of the survivors. If only we can capture that information and use it. It's in commercial organizations like mine and many of yours um, when we understand the vulnerabilities of our supply chains. It's in the financial institutions Geraldine was talking about and Rob was talking about, recognizing the transactions that derive from exploitative activity. And it's in law enforcement and government. So not just law enforcement, but think about social services and the kind of stuff they get involved in. And all of that incredibly valuable, valuable information that in and of itself isn't that helpful apart from that in that one unique situation. But bring it together. And then when you can bring that together with all of the other information that's out there, news feeds, um, you know, public domain, social media content, um, my goodness, you start to be able to find some amazing stuff. Now, the data is hugely sensitive, and it poses really big challenges to sharing it. We've talked about collaboration and partnering and sharing it. 
So that's a huge challenge, and it's one we have to we have to be able to protect it. We have to be able to protect the privacy uh, and the safety of the individuals from whom we get it, um, uh, which is really key. So last month in New York, some of the people in this room were there. Um, very exciting. Um, uh, we we were able to we stopped traffic. We were able to announce the launch of the traffic an, uh, analysis hub. So this is a new consortium project. Um, IBM stop the traffic. Um, uh, Western Union, Barclays, Lloyds, Liberty Group, Europol, University College London, all coming together for data sh for a data sharing and uh, an analysis an analytics platform that will enable us to disrupt human trafficking. Um, we're going to use uh, IBM Watson AI, artificial intelligence. We're going to use it along with an other analytical tools um, because we'll be able to analyze this blended data that we're going to have from all these distant sources and uncover the hotspots and the routes that have, been, um, that have not been evident before. We haven't seen them. We haven't spotted those digital footprints, uh, uh, fingerprints in the past, and now we can see them. Now, this hub, it runs in on, the, on, on the IBM cloud. It's very, very secure, so really important um, that we were able to meet the security needs of all of our partners. Um, all the data that's contributed to this hub is actually anonymized, so um, it's not person, personally identifiable. Neil, you talked about that a little bit earlier. Because um, obviously, we need to protect these individuals that are of paramount importance. Now, we believe that this platform, but probably more importantly, this multi-sector collaboration, um, will actually be a game changer in facilitating uh, information sharing and collaboration across organizations and across national borders going to enable us to get ahead of the traffickers for the first time, because no, we are not going to rescue our way out of this, nor are we going to prosecute our way out of, it, out of it, but we might just intelligence our way out of it, and wouldn't that be cool? Now, my boss always says to me, stop telling me, Caroline, show me. Okay, so I'm not going to show you, but my glamorous assistant, John McGrath, is going to show you exactly what a traffic analysis hub looks like and how it works. John. Thank you. So uh, have we any technologists in the house? Excellent. <laughs> so I was t toying with the idea of having Mission Impossible playing here because they give me five minutes to show you this, okay? Now, at least in New York, I had seven, and that was a stretch. So this is going to be a bit tight. Now, who wants to see a live demo or a recording? <coughs> live demo, okay. They always warn you never to work with children or live demos. So <laughs> this is a live demo of the hub. Um, there's a couple of different things we're going to show you, but to give you a bit of background, this is about two years in the, in the oven, cooking away and percolating. We started actually working on building it in September. This is a proof of concept. It's about today, tomorrow, to be released to the tra Traffic Analysis Hub uh, users. So they'll start to come in, look at this, and give us feedback, okay? So you guys are getting a kind of, uh, not quite a sneak peek, because they got that in New York last month, but you're getting the second sneak peek. OK, so it is a geospatial display at this level, OK? Along the top here, we have our navigation. Map analysis, news explorer, analysis register, and financial transfers demo, OK? I'm going to jump around a little bit, because in the true flavor of a demo, it's all over the place, right? Some of it's running not officially, and I'm not supposed to show you. Some of it is official, and I am going to show it to you anyway. So the map analysis is this piece here. It shows you a map. Within the map, you can decide what data sources you're going to show. As was mentioned earlier, all the data here is non-specific data. No matter who contributes it, it cannot be traced back to an individual or a specific person, right? The caveat on that is the GDELT data, the Google da Earth data uh, for exploitation for migrant, and the Watson News data and the NGO data, as a matter of fact, is all sourced from open source information. It's all based on information that's publicly available. We're sourcing it in different manners, OK? Now, one of the things that's happening here is for the NGO incident reports, Sarah and people like Sarah in Stop the Traffic are gathering this stuff manually. It goes into spreadsheets, into CSV files, gets sent to us, we load it up, OK? Not a very efficient use of a good analyst day, OK? So part of our challenge from day one was to drive this to scale and automate it as much as we can. So we're using Watson, and we're leveraging off the things that Google are doing to help get scale in the data so that a data analyst can start analyzing data, not collecting and curating data, OK? So if we look at this, 
You've got a number of different styles you can apply to the map background. They're not important. We can look at things like route maps. So what are route maps? Right now, we're picking up the migrant data from the Google project. Very useful because it's, it's a large data set. We get it every day. It's very rich. Why is it important to us? Because inside of the migrant data, there's a reflection of a percentage of trafficking that's happening. So there's a correlation between the two data sets. And that's one of the terms I hope you'll take away from tonight. Correlation is one of the big things we're focused on at the moment. So within the data sets here, for instance, we can see I'm from Ireland. So we can see within the, the re most recent data set according to this timeline here that we've picked up from Google, these are the points that have connected to Ireland in the migrant data set. Okay? Similarly, if we go to a place where we know there's going to be a large data, so if we look at Syria, this gives you kind of the scale of what's happening. Now, one of our research teams in Dublin did an analysis of this, and the purpose of what they were trying to do was predict the flow of migration through the Balkan region. And that was the, actually the starting point of the hub. So from that, we've built everything here. There is a part of this that allows us to look at currently known pipe and flow, and we're using a water flow analogy or algorithm to try and predict what will happen to the human flow if you, if you ratchet down the capacity of a pipe or the capacity of a root. And that's actually in part of the research project at the moment around migration flows. Now, <coughs> in New York, they were very interested in this picture, as this showed the people coming and going from New York within migrant data. And I'm thinking from London, you guys would be interested in that picture. Okay? Again, this is a short time span that we're looking at. Now, if we turn off the route maps, because this is just one part of a display, I'm going to show you lots of different ways of representing data. Our next phase in the project is trying to get real analysts in there to tell us what data needs to be represented in what way and mine to those correlations, okay? So if we're looking at the markers, this starts to give you the counts of specific pieces of data. Now we've got along the top here our data sources. So if we turn off the migrant data, for instance, this will take a second or two, it reduces the count drastically. So this is one of the challenges. We're currently ratcheting up the Watson feed to try and pick up more and more and more verifiable data incidents. So Watson every day goes out and picks up about 200,000 news sources. And it trawls it and it puts it into a collection. We then interrogate the collection looking for references to human trafficking relating terms. From the, fr from the subset that we get, we create another collection. Then we try to figure out how many of those are incidents versus reports and speeches and, stu and events that have been organized. For the incidents, we try to figure out can we mine a geo-coordinate so we can put it on the map? What the guys have done is mine the geo-coordinates onto the map with a degree of accuracy that we're starting to ramp up now. The next step is mine the pieces of information that are up here. So the trafficking type, the subtype, and the location types. So if we start to turn on and off sources and destinations, you start to see you can filter now the data you're looking at. Okay? So you can see these are just the transit points in the current data set. Most of this data that you're looking at is coming from the NGO contributed data. The NGOs will contribute their data through this mechanism here. You can download, anybody who's a member of the hub can download any data they're looking at in the map, or you can upload through another click point. Okay? Now, this all is reasonably useful, but the thing that kind of excites people are the, hot, are the hot heat maps. So here you're starting to look at heat maps for specific pieces of data. And as we start to turn on the migrant data, we see a different picture in the heat map. And this kind of gives you the visibly the picture of why we're looking at scale in the data. Once we get the scale in the data, we start to see the patterns that we're interested in. So we can see, and it's, it's common knowledge to everybody else, there's kind of a flow of people happening from Southeast Asia up through the Middle East into Europe. There's a flow of people happening along the east coast of Africa. We can see from sub-Saharan Africa some routes going up through the Mediterranean. All the stuff we're seeing in the news is there in the data. Okay? We can see also in America the flows that are going up from Central America through Mexico, but also the Caribbean route. Interestingly, with the timeline, this will take a bit of time, we can see the picture changes as we change the period that we're looking at. And this is kind of important because everything we're trying to do around scale has to be temporal. So now if we start to look at, uh, maybe we'll turn off this one, and we'll have a little play around with the Watson data. We'll turn off the Watson data. 
And now we're maybe turn off the NGO data. So this is the basic starting point. So this is the GDELT uh, exploitation data. It's a subset of the migrant data. It's classified specifically. So if we look at adding it and building the layers, so where does it correlate with the, with the NGO specific data? Where does it correlate with the Watson data that we're capturing? You see where the heat maps are starting to overlay. So this is validating the data sets and helping people to uh, identify the hotspots that we want to look at, okay? <coughs> now, suppose we've built up a little picture here that we're interested in, and we'd like to print it. We can pop on an icon here, and this will give us the option to print out the screen we just looked at, or we can save it as a PDF for future reference or for insertion into other reports. So this one of the requirements that Sarah and her team and the first meeting of the hub, all the analysts pretty much told us this was required. If we look at News Explorer, actually there's one more thing over here. So this is showing within the data set we're looking at, we're looking at the global interaction of different locations. So we can start to identify a country like Cambodia and see what other relationships between Cambodia and other data in that data set is available. This whole pane here is an area where we're starting to work now on how do we give you business intelligence type displays of the same data you're seeing geospatially. So News Explorer, when you pop that, this guy pops up. I've taken a shortcut because of time. Um, so labor exploitation, if I search, this is a Watson free search. So the collection we talked about earlier, 200,000 sources updated every day, this is the same source you're looking at here. Any analyst in the hub can come in here now and they can do a search of any term they want and it'll start to return data to them. So by default, it returns your top stories, it returns your top entities and the entities are classified into topics, companies, people, okay? All of this is happening automatically. It's a part of the default Watson enrichment. Okay. And we get the sentiment analysis. So based on the information in this return data set and this, the context in which it's been mentioned, what's the general sentiment? It doesn't reflect on a particular news agency positively or negatively, and it won't reflect on organizations positively or negatively in a minute. It's just showing that this is where the positive and negative sentiment is in the context of the syntax that's been used. Anomaly detection, this is kind of interesting, so this will tell us for that particular term, anomalies in incidents of reporting over time. So I'm getting waved at already. Can't be five minutes. Is it five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I know I talk too much. <laughs> okay, so anomaly detection tells us there's something happening on the 26th of September. I can show you that on the map, but I won't have time now. Um, this tells you co-mentions and trends, so the most commonly mentioned organizations <coughs> who are related to the topic that we searched on, labor exploitation. Let me see. Uh, this one. So I'll leave you with this one. Please give me enough time. <laughs> so this is what's cooking. That is not, I'm not supposed to be showing anybody. Um, <laughs> so what we're looking at here is we're starting to talk to some of the organizations in the financial institution space around sharing some information on anomaly transactions for a period. All of this is synthetic information right now, so don't worry about it. What we're, o what we're underlaying here is the heat map for the NGO incidents. We're overlaying it with transactions from specific locations, and what we're trying to do is isolate specific transaction patterns that seem to correlate with something we've seen in the past, and therefore, we think may be of interest now. And the idea is to sort of send the alert back to the organization that's a member of the hub to say, in the pattern matching correlation we're doing here, we think we're seeing something that's consistent with what we saw in the past. And in the past, we're able to say there was a report of an incident or several incidents. And therefore, we think you need to look a bit closer here. So what we're trying to get to is not being a, me a needle in the haystack anymore. Trying to get to the point where we can actually give them some direction to say, in more or less real time, the transaction pattern we see correlated with a bunch of other things in real time that we're hoping to gather in here, including the artificially generated data, point to a, a specific problem. And if we look at, 
This is isolating all the anomalies across all the periods. So this kind of gives you a quick overview of, as a financial institution, this may be useful in directing where you look and when. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay, now questions. Who is listening? Um, uh, I just do have to say, uh, he is both a fantastic, glamorous assistant, but he is also the architect of that. And I, I think the journey that we've been on again over the years is bringing together unique skills. I haven't got that skill. Many of you in this room were nodding vigorously, and you have. But actually, we need a whole combination of that. So I want to say thank you. Thank you to John for the hours he spent, not in his day job, putting that together. Okay, so firstly, a few more minutes and then time for uh, another drink. You might have bought a raffle ticket. I'm not going to ask who has, who hasn't. No, okay. Bring up the prizes because I'm just going to do this. These have been generously donated by a number of people. Um, Amy is, uh, uh, and Jack are going to come up. Amy is the person who is an intern in our office and probably contacted you. So first of all, round of applause for Amy and Jack. Um, okay, so the first one is a tour of the House of Lords, an afternoon tea for two. Okay, so you need to announce colour and number. Okay, that was, it's yellow and it's 25. So, brilliant, you get that. Okay, brilliant. I'm going to carry on to the next one. Come and grab what it is. I think it's like the menu. <laughs> okay, next one. This is a grand gourmet tour and wine tasting for two at Bolney Wine Estate in Sussex. Bolney's a good place to go. This is blue and it's five. Blue and number five. Yay! Okay. Uh, third is, and forgive us for um, uh, needing to adjust this, please forgive us, the cooking, cooking Academy, but this is a fantastic one-day Thai cookery class for two worth 199, and it is yellow and 30. Someone was really disappointed over there. Hazel! <laughs> Woo! Brilliant. Okay, and finally, but not finally, a magnum. I've never done this before. This is like points for prizes. <laughs> it was like a magnum of award-winning 2013 Blanc de Blanc. Is that what you say, Neil? Blanc. Sorry, Blanc de Blanc. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Liverpool in me, Blanc de Blanc. Um, <laughs> British sparkling wine from Bolney, and it is... It's yellow. And it's number 10. Oh, it's mine. Woo! No, no, it isn't. Is anybody, who is it? Number 10. If they are not here, we're going to go again. Is that a unanimous decision? Okay, we're going to go again. If anyone's gone to the toilet, they shouldn't have left. Okay, here we go. It is yellow. Sorry, um, madam, the woman who just came in. <laughs> okay, okay. It's called regret. Okay. <laughs> Yellow, 35. Oh. <laughs> there is brilliant. Thanks, Jack. That is fantastic. I think, Jerry, that's your first visit to a Stop the Traffic event. He's coming again. Um, I want to just close. I do want to thank everybody. I want to thank 
uh, Facebook for what is an extraordinary venue. Um, and thank you, Gail, for partnership, friendship, and future. Um, I also want to thank my team, because I stand here just as one Liverpudlian girl. And actually, there is a massive team around me. Thank you, partners. Thank you for friends. Thank you for people that were going. Thank you for coming. I hope that you have been inspired. I hope that together we are going to do something. Last week, a week ago, seven days, I stood quietly. Two minutes. And we remember them. A hundred years ago, we remember them. What struck me as I stood there in the weeks preceding and the weeks following is the incredible amount of stories that are told and shared by family. Uh, you know someone, you know, and you're listening to the pride in my great, great, great grandfather, mother. Here's their picture. Here's their story. Here's what they did. Here's their medals. And we stand and we remember them. A hundred years ago, we had the ability to build and visit graves with names and ages. And it struck me that today, with the millions in the biggest battle we fight, my friends, in today's age... We don't know their names. Have we made progress? In years to come, will we remember them? So I don't finish together tonight because we feel, come listen to Stop the Traffic because we've got the answer. I truly stand here believing we have got a model with a solution. We've got something that we've learned in 15 years. I hope we've got something of a brand that says we'll share, because that's the revolution. I believe and are passionate that we've reached a moment when we have something that we can do that is going to change the world. And therefore, I'm standing here because I want us together to look to a future, because we have to be different than what we've done before. Because as much as I've committed 15 years of my life to this, and that's why I really do look like I look, <laughs> we are not winning this fight. And the panel so articulately said, all the leads, all the pioneers, these incredible people that we're working with and the many millions beside who are just part of this movement, but we're not winning. So if we're going to create a different future, we're on the brink of understanding with technology and the power that it's got that John demonstrated, the power of data and the model that we systemically at Stop the Traffic believe we have to engage. We need banks, we need business, we need civil society, we need the nine-year-old that today holds a mobile in their hands. We need communities everywhere because if we're going to be dangerous, if we're going to be able to do this fight and win, we need to do this differently. And therefore, I am really excited <laughs> at this moment because the only way we can ever do this is if we do this together. So please, if you're sitting here and you haven't joined us, do you know, if you want to write notes and think that you can go and build this somewhere else, I just say, God bless you, go. But if you're sitting and thinking you have things that you can do to join in with the family that is, the community we're building, please join us. We are all connected to this story. We all have a legacy to those that are nameless by what we're wearing, what we spend, the communities we live in, who lives next door. We're all carrying a story. It's just none of us know their name. So we send you and hope that you will do a number of things for us. I hope you'll take this. I hope that you'll understand and read and encourage others. I, 
unashamedly stand here and ask that if you have finance and funding, please fund us. Because there is a critical moment that we are at where our model is there, but nothing's going to happen unless we scale. Scale costs. Scale is critical. And we need you to come and help us. I think if you asked anyone in this room the sort of relative budgets between many of the businesses sitting here and stop the traffics, they'd probably smile. It's amazing what you can do on little, but it's limiting. It's limiting when you get to a moment like this. And this is the moment of history that we need to scale. And so please give. If you're interested in the Data Hub, sharing data, then please come see us. There will be a number of the team out there. They have iPads. Please don't leave this place without going to one. And just if it's tick, we want to know more. Please do that so we can, from strangers, become friends. Because together, I hope you've seen, we can do something quite extraordinary. We remember them. A hundred years ago, it was that moment where I stood and remembered them. But the future is about being predictive, and we're not there yet. The future is about disruption when we can start to see what we can't see now. And for us, we will be held accountable for what we do. All of us. In a way, the generations 100 years to come will look back at us and they will say, what did you do with what you had? And if it's that we created 100,000 different models, we failed. But if they see a moment in history where we begin to collaborate, do it, share, Build something that actually becomes dangerous in this fight to those at the moment who stand aside and watch us fragment or compete. I think we're at a moment where together we can not just remember, but we don't need to count the fallen. So please join in, please share. Thank you for all that you do and represent in this room. And we look forward in the future to remembering those who didn't fall. Thank you. There's a drink. Enjoy. And please speak to us. iPads are out there. You'll never escape. <laughs>